The explosion could be seen for 15 kilometers, black smoke rising 100 meters into the sky, 660,000 liters of fuel gone. But what makes this different from every other strike you've seen? Distance. This Russian train was 35 kilometers behind enemy lines, protected by systems that should have made it untouchable. Four Ukrainian pilots were about to prove that nowhere is safe anymore. And they're going to do it with drones that cost less than your laptop. 35 kilometers away, operators from Ukraine's elite Ronin unit monitor degraded video feeds through analog transmitters that shouldn't work at this range. Four FPV quadcopters push through distances that every military manual says are impossible. Standard drones give out at 3 kilometers, but these are already at 15 and climbing. Behind them, Kabul 9 intelligence feeds real-time updates while Alpha Unit intercepts Russian communications. The next group's counter-jamming equipment stands ready to burn holes right through the electromagnetic interference when needed. Suddenly, the video feed on the operator screen turned to static. Without warning, the attack drone is now blind. Its signal to the operator has just been severed. The first repeater drone, the critical relay link that made this 35-kilometer mission possible, had just been destroyed. A Russian Verba man pads operator had scored a hit on the repeater hovering at 500 meters. And without it, the attack drones couldn't receive commands. The entire mission was seconds from failure. This is the challenge of extreme range drone operations. Ukrainian forces use analog 5.88 gigahertz video transmission because it has zero latency. Digital signals would be easier to extend, but they have a 200 millisecond delay that makes precision strikes impossible. When you're flying at 80 kilometers per hour toward a moving train, 200 milliseconds means missing by 5 meters. So, Ukraine stuck with analog, even though it meant needing these vulnerable repeater drones positioned every 5 kilometers. The Ronin unit operator watched his screen, waiting 3 seconds, 5 seconds. Then the backup repeater came online. This drone had been flying lower at just 200 meters, which was harder for the Verba to detect, but 2 kilometers off the optimal position. The signal strength dropped to 60%, making the video grainy, but it was enough. The backup repeater was now the critical link in a chain stretching toward the Russian fuel train, carrying 660,000 liters of diesel and aviation fuel. This wasn't just the Ronin unit operating alone. The mission involved four specialized groups working in perfect coordination. KBBL-9, Ukraine's defense intelligence unit, had been tracking this specific train for weeks, learning its schedule and fuel car configuration. The Security Services Alpha Unit provided electronic overwatch monitoring Russian communications for any sign they'd been detected. The State Special Communications Service Next Group stood ready with their counter-jamming equipment. Each unit had a specific role. Ronin flew the attack drones. Kabul 9 provided real-time intelligence updates. Alpha intercepted Russian responses, and Next would burn holes through the jamming when needed. The backup repeater strategy was deliberate. Ukrainian forces always deploy three repeaters per chain, with two backups flying at different altitudes. The primary hovers at 500 meters for optimal signal propagation. The first backup stays at 200 meters, harder to detect, but with reduced range. The second backup skims at just 100 meters, nearly invisible to air defense, but only useful as a last resort. They maintain a two-kilometer spacing to prevent multiple losses from a single missile. Ronin operators train for exactly this scenario. Each pilot logs over 200 hours in simulators flying with degraded signals, learning to use railroad tracks, rivers, and power lines as navigation references when video quality drops. They practice flying blind for up to 30 seconds using mental timing and memorized terrain to maintain course. Count to 15. Slight right to follow the tracks. Count to 10. Pull up for the power lines. These mantras keep drones flying when technology fails. The Russians knew Ukrainian drones were coming. They always knew. The question was whether their defense systems could stop them. In the distance, the fuel train continued rolling at 40 kilometers per hour, unaware that four FPV drones were now converging on its position. The lead drone had 20 kilometers to go. What came next would determine if Ukraine's gamble would pay off or if four drones would go down in Russia airspace for nothing. But as the lead drone pushed deeper into enemy territory, at the 25 kilometer mark, the drone entered an electromagnetic nightmare. The video feed didn't just degrade, it turned into pure chaos. Random pixels rolling static, and then nothing. The drone had just entered the engagement zone of the weapon system you see here. This is called the Russian R-330ZH-Z electronic warfare system. 
this truck-mounted jammer can flood the electromagnetic spectrum from 100 to 2,000 megahertz, creating a 15-kilometer bubble where nothing gets through. At least that's the theory. The operator immediately initiated frequency hopping, 40 channels per second, searching for gaps in the Russian jamming. The R330Z is powerful, but it can't cover every frequency simultaneously with full power. There are dead zones, tiny gaps that last milliseconds. The Ukrainian operators had learned to find them. The frequency patterns weren't random. The Ronin unit had pre-programmed sequences based on dozens of previous missions. They'd learned that Russian jammers typically focus power on common FPB frequencies, 5.8, 2.4, and 1.2 gigahertz. But there are gaps in other frequencies that the Russians often miss. The operator's frequency hopping followed a specific pattern. Three hops on common bands to confuse Russian operators, then a quick jump to a gap frequency for two seconds of clear audio, then back to hopping. It's a dance that Ukrainian pilots have perfected through painful trial and error. For 15 agonizing seconds, the drone flew blind. The GPS showed the drone's position as 10 kilometers away from where it actually was. The Russians were spoofing satellite signals too, but Ukrainian pilots trained for this, hours in simulators, flying by mental maps, counting seconds to estimate distance, using the sun and moon's positions for direction when everything else fails. Behind the lead drone, three more FPV drones followed at precisely 30-second intervals. This spacing was crucial. If they flew too close together, Russian jamming could catch all four simultaneously. Too far apart, and the lead drone's path evolve, finding through the jamming wouldn't help the others. 30 seconds meant each drone could follow the successful frequency pattern of the leader while the Russians were still adjusting their jammers. The second drone was already entering the jamming zone, its operator watching the lead drone's frequency hops and copying them exactly. Then the breakthrough they needed, the Ukrainian next group activated its counter EW system. This isn't subtle, it's electronic warfare brute force. The powerful directional transmission that burns a hole through the jamming. But it comes with a cost. For 30 seconds, the Ukrainian position lights up on every Russian detection system like a lighthouse in the dark. The 30-second exposure window was a calculated risk. Ukrainian intelligence knew Russian artillery response time averaged 45 seconds from detection to first shell. But 30 seconds of clear signal at a time could push the drones through 10 kilometers of heavily jammed airspace. Next group operators had their hands on the power switch, watching the clock. At 28 seconds, they cut transmission and relocate, giving them a 17-second safety margin. Three previous missions had validated this timing, aggressive enough to be effective, but conservative enough to survive. The video feed returned, fuzzy, but functional. Through the static, the operator could see the railroad tracks below. The drone was now following them at just 50 meters altitude, using the steel rails as a navigation guide that no amount of GPS spoofing could hide. But the R330Z was just the first layer. As the drone pushed forward, the Russians were readying new equipment. The operators switched to manual control, abandoning any hope of GPS navigation. From here on, it would be pure visual flying through degraded video. The fuel train was now 10 kilometers away, and Russian operators were frantically working to vector their air defenses onto the incoming threat. Russian commanders were about to learn a lesson that turned one of their most advanced detection systems into Ukraine's greatest advantage. The Kasuka 4 system detected them first. This massive electronic warfare vehicle can spot drone control signals at 150 kilometers, and now it has a solid track on the incoming threats. The Russian operator immediately vetoed a Panzer S-1 air defense system to intercept. The Panzer's radar locked onto the lead drone, and its automated systems calculated an intercept solution. Eight seconds to missile launch. But the Ukrainians had anticipated this. Suddenly, six new contacts appeared on the Russian screens. Decoy drones costing just $200 each were equipped with corner reflectors that made them look much larger than threats on radar. The Panzer's targeting computer couldn't tell the difference between a $200 decoy and a $3,000 attack drone carrying military ordnance. The Russian operator had to make a choice. Engage all targets and risk running out of missiles or try to identify the real threats and risk letting them through. He chose to engage. The Panzer's launcher elevated and missiles started streaking into the sky, but only four of the six decoys activated properly. Two real drones were still exposed. Four of six decoys worked better than usual. Keep in mind, these are garage-built from racing drone parts and energy drink cans. 
Cold weather drains batteries, jamming fry circuits, but even four was enough. The Panzer just wasted eight of 12 missiles on garbage worth less than a laptop. Previous Ukrainian attacks sent 20 decoys just to empty Russian magazines. Now, the Panzer had four missiles left and a 20-minute reload time. Despite being nearly out of missiles, it still had its two 30mm autocannons. This is where terrain masking saved the mission. The real attack drones dropped just to 10 meters altitude, literally skimming the grass. The Panzer S-1 has a minimum engagement altitude of 15 meters. Anything lower and its radar can't separate the target from ground clutter. The drones were threading the needle between being too high and getting shot or too low and crashing into obstacles. Flying at grass level meant dodging something every second. Power lines cross the terrain every few hundred meters, invisible until the last moment through degraded video. Trees appear suddenly in the static. Even large birds become lethal obstacles at 80 kilometers per hour. Ronin pilots memorize terrain using satellite photos, creating mental maps of every power line, every tree line, every rise that could hide obstacles. They practice specific routes dozens of times in simulators, learning to climb three meters for the power lines at kilometer 27, then to bank left to avoid the radio tower at kilometer 29. Meanwhile, the Russian Kasuka 4 was still tracking the control signals, but it had a different problem. Meanwhile, the Russian Kasuka 4 was still tracking the control signals, but it had a different problem. It could detect the analog video feeds but couldn't jam them effectively. Analog signals degrade gracefully. Even with 80% interference, you still get 20% picture. Digital signals would be completely blocked, but they'd also be useless for precision strikes at this range. Four kilometers from the target now, and the train had received a warning of incoming drones. The locomotive's whistle shrieked as the engineer pushed the throttle forward, trying to accelerate. A moving train at 40 kilometers per hour is exponentially harder to hit than a stationary target. The hit probability drops from 90% to just 30%. But the Ukrainians had planned for this too. Through the degraded video feed, the operator would see the smoke from the locomotive stack. The train was accelerating, but it would need time to reach full speed, time it didn't have. The lead drone was now three kilometers out, screaming towards its target at 80 kilometers per hour. The next 120 seconds would end with either burning drones or a burning train. Two kilometers from impact, the final layer of Russian defense is activated. The Pole 21 jammer mounted on the train itself powered up, creating an electromagnetic bubble designed to fry any drone's navigation systems. GPS signals vanished instantly. Glonus disappeared, even the magnetic compass went haywire. But the video feed, that degraded static field analog video, kept coming through. The Ukrainians are now flying purely by visual reference through a screen that looked like a 1980s television with bad reception. They could see the railroad tracks below, using them like a highway leading straight to the target. The train was picking up speed, now doing 45 kilometers per hour and accelerating. The first operator started counting cars through the static. Seven, six, five. The lead fuel car was the priority target. Hit that and the fire would spread backward through the train. Miss it and the locomotive might decouple the undamaged cars and escape with most of the fuel. He marked his target mentally. The third car behind the locomotive. At an altitude of 500 meters, the video starts to break up completely. Pole 21 is winning, overwhelming the analog signal with raw electromagnetic interference. The Ukrainians are essentially blind, flying based on memory and trained instincts. There are three seconds left until impact. Two seconds. One. At 10.32 a.m., the first drone crashes into the fuel transport ship. The RPG-7 warhead detonated on impact. It shaped charge, punching through the steel wall and spraying molten copper into 60,000 liters of diesel fuel. The explosion was immediate and catastrophic. A fireball erupted from the car and the train's emergency brakes automatically engaged bringing the entire convoy to a screeching halt. But this was just the beginning. 30 seconds behind the leader, the second drone was already in its terminal dive. The massive smoke plume from the first strike should have made targeting impossible, but the operator used the railroad tracks as his guide, counting the seconds to estimate distance. The second drone hit the fourth car, ensuring the fire would spread along the entire length of the train. The third drone arrived 30 seconds later, its operator facing a wall of black smoke and flame. The thermal cameras were overwhelmed entirely, showing nothing but white-hot interference. But he knew exactly where the seventh car would be. They'd studied this train configuration for days. 
Flying blind through the smoke, the drone emerged just 50 meters from its target. The operator had one second to adjust. The drone struck dead center. The fourth and final drone had the hardest job. The entire train was now an inferno with flames reaching 100 meters into the sky. But one fuel car at the rear remained intact. And leaving it would mean leaving salvageable fuel for the Russians. He pushed forward into the black cloud, counting down from his last visual reference. Three, two, one. At 10, 19, and 30 seconds, the fourth drone found its mark. The final fuel car erupted, completing the destruction. All 11 tankers were now burning, 660,000 liters of fuel, creating a fire that would burn for six hours. The railroad tracks beneath were already warping from the heat, the concrete ties cracking and crumbling. This vital supply line would be unusable for at least 72 hours. Four drones costing a total of $12,000 had just destroyed $3 million worth of fuel and infrastructure. But more importantly, they proven that nowhere in occupied territory was safe from Ukrainian strikes. The age of impunity for rear area supply lines is over. If Ukrainian drones reach 35 kilometers today, Russian logistics officers are doing the math. Tomorrow, it could be 50. Next week, 100. No train, no depot, no bridge is safe. And Ukraine has thousands more drones ready to go right now. Bye for now.